Thirdly, God wants God wants you to stop prescribing blame. Stop prescribing blame. Verse 30, the prodigal son makes this pro- this proclamation. But as soon as this son of yours came, who has devoured your livelihood with harlots, you killed the fat of calf for him. Now, he doesn't just say, as soon as he came, he you as soon as he came back, you killed the fat of calf for him. He makes a point to point out his faults. And the only way sometimes that that he, he's not doing, he's not speaking that just to be, he's not re- speaking the truth in love here to his brother and admonishing him to turn from his sins and re, you know return to the to the grace of God. He's not doing that, so don't 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 get that twisted up. He's simply criticizing him for um, what he deems is his wrongdoing, which was. And so he says to him, "This, but as soon as the son of yours came, who has devoured your livelihood with harlots, you killed the fatted calf for him." He's trying to blame his brother for his sin in order to um, take attention off the fact that he's a really um, selfish, self-righteous dude, and God doesn't drive with that and he doesn't fall for it in Luke chapter 18 Jesus tells us another story verses 9 through 14 also he spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others two men went up to the temple to pray one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector the Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself God I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, adulterers, or even as this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the tax collector standing afar off would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. This is Jesus speaking not some erstwhile theologian. Jesus says, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exhausted. (laughs) Exalted, excuse me, not exhausted. Exalted. There is a trouble that we have with really accepting God's grace to the fullest that that he would that he would bless us to do so because it requires us getting over our own sin and it requires us being um, gracious about the sin of others and a lot of times we do one of two things in our treatment of ourselves and our treatment of others. And it's, this is something that I've learned um, over the past few years, and I've learned it um, whew, through, through uh, hard, the school of hard knocks, but, uh, but it's become very real to me. I call it shame and blame theology. Shame and blame theology. And the idea is that if we are, um, if unless we are dependent on God's grace, then we are willing to shame ourselves for our imperfection and also to blame others for theirs. Sometimes we blame other, others to uh, take the attention off of our, our own shame because we are shame and um, without giving you a you know, half hour dissertation on that I'm simply going to tell you that neither one of those shame nor blame have any place in the kingdom of God I could give you half a dozen scriptures to start with that 
negate the reality of shame in your life because of what Jesus Christ has done for you. And those in and of themselves, and I can certainly give you more that if necessary, but then in and of itself takes away your right to blame others for their imperfection. But man, we do a lot of that, don't we? We do a lot of beating ourselves up and a lot of beating others up. Can you imagine what God's church would be free to do if we stopped doing that? If we stopped beating ourselves up and stopped beating others up? I don't know what we'd have to talk about. Maybe Jesus and lost people. And lost people that need Jesus. And maybe we put the two together and my goodness what might happen. My goodness what might happen. But it's going to take us to stop prescribing blame and stop accepting our own shame and doing so by drawing near the cross. Staying near the cross. Recognizing that there's nothing that um, I can give and nothing that I should try to give. I told this story um, to a group of young people um, months ago now, but... uh, it's always it's fascinating me since I heard it and um, because I thought it was kind of maybe just well anyway I'll tell it to you and you decide it's a simple story about a little boy playing baseball in his backyard and his neighbor's backyard is adjoining his this is you know in a in a subdivision and the neighbor had a had a nicer bigger backyard that was much better to play ball in. And so the neighbor told him, listen, son, if you want to play ball, if you want to hit over into my yard, it's fine. He said, just don't hit the ball in my yard because I, I, I just paid a lot of money for this picture window and I don't want you to um, destroy it. And so he said, play wherever you want to, just don't hit the ball at that picture window. So the boy hit the ball hit over to the neighbor's yard, walked back, hit the ball over, walked back. And then one time he just got tired of doing that and wanted to hit the ball back to his yard for the neighbor's yard, just like he wasn't supposed to do. He's like, well, he's like, you know, I'm pretty good at, at um, determining where I'm going to hit it. So he um, hauls off and swats that ball, and guess where it goes? Right through that huge picture window. Destroys it. And the boy is paralyzed with fear. And the neighbor comes out, and the boy can't even speak. He's so overcome with uh, with grief and guilt and um, just human petrification. And so, the expecting the neighbor to, you know, throttle him, the boy apologizes, and the neighbor says, the boy apologizes and pleads his case. And the neighbor says, okay. I forgive you. I forgive you for doing what I told you not to do and for that resulting in the breaking of my window. And so I use that story, that that part of the story, to exemplify mercy. God's mercy towards us. Because God tells us what not to do and we do it anyway and we break the planet. We break the whole stinking planet. And yet he says to us, because of Jesus paying for all the ways you've broken the planet, um, if you, uh, when we recognize that and place our faith in him, I, I forgive you. That's his mercy when he gives us not what, when he does not give us what we do deserve. That's God's mercy. He does not give us what we do deserve. But then the story 